Hi everybody and a happy new year. I hope you all managed to have a lovely Christmas and it's welcome or welcome back to Murder at Bedtime. I'm your aging, rotund, grey-haired, very wrinkled host, Lyndon, with my 15 minute waffle free, no frills, bedtime story. All the waffle is at the end of the story. So you can just switch me off then or just listen on to the thanks, the acknowledgements and the shout outs. Anyway, with that, let's crack on with the Denham tragedy. Actually, it's the Denham massacre. But when I put it in on the podcast, I use tragedy. Totally wrong. Never mind. But we'll carry on with that. In the dark early hours of May the 22nd, 1870, the village blacksmith of Denham, Buckinghamshire, which is about 30 miles up the road from where I live now, was up very early and dressed in his cottage on Cheapside Lane. 35-year-old Emmanuel Marshall went outside to his lean-to forge adjoining the cottage. Inside the cottage, still sleeping, was his wife, Charlotte, Mother Mary, Sister Mary Jane and three daughters, eight-year-old Mary, six-year-old Thurza and four-year-old Gertrude. A fourth child, son Francis, 18 months old, was at the time staying at his grandfather's house in Uxbridge. Very lucky boy. As Emmanuel entered the forge, a dark figure emerged from the shadows and hit him from behind with a metal poker so hard the poker broke in two. He then, using a sledgehammer and axe, pulverised the poor smithy's head and face. Now, probably believing he needed to change his blood-soaked clothes, he made his way to the front door and as he opened it he came across Charlotte and Mary Jane who had been awoken by the noise. Cold-bloodedly and brutally he killed the two women with the hammer and the axe. He then must have heard Mary the grandmother trying desperately to shepherd the three girls into the back kitchen to either escape uh, or hide them, but unfortunately the man found them cowering. He then heartlessly killed them one by one, as the others must have been totally terrified, waiting helplessly for their turn. When he'd finished, he went upstairs, for some reason destroying a photograph of Emmanuel on the way, then changed out of his clothes and into some of the blacksmiths. He took a watch, a knife, a pistol and a carpet bag. He then went downstairs back into the forge and took the dead man's boots, put them on, then disappeared into the night. Now this is most probably how the massacre happened. No one can really say because they weren't there, but that's what they worked it out at. Now, no one can imagine the terror that this family must have felt. Sarah Jane, the sister, was getting married in two days' time and moving out of the house. Now, nobody missed the family on the Sunday. But on the Monday, Mary Ann Spark, so many Marys, turned up at the cottage to have tea with her sister, Getting no answer and the doors being locked, she saw two workmen walking by and asked if one would go up a ladder and look through the bedroom windows. He saw nothing apart from heaped up bedclothes, but he then went round the back and looked in the ground floor windows. After seeing what he saw, he knew he had to get the police and fast. He ran to get Denham's local Bobby, P- PC Taverna, and he went to the scene immediately. 
What he saw would change his life forever. He knew this family, he knew these children, and here they were, massacred, covered in blood and gore. He had only been on the force three years and only one in Denim. Buckingham Constabulary had no detectives and knowing this was a huge case, they called for the help of Uxbridge Police. Superintendent Thomas Dunham, 37 years old and 17 years in the job with a string of arrests that had been reported in the newspapers which had made him some sort of star was informed he would lead the case and he didn't disappoint. Arriving in Denham, Dunham too was visibly upset by what he saw. Himself a married man with children, he was determined to get this evil man and fast. On the 24th of May the inquest opened. Yes, if you've been here before you've guessed it, at the pub. This time, the Swan Inn in Denham. The coroner said it was necessary for the jurors to visit the murder scene with the bodies in situ. This was horrendous for them, with many in tears when they saw the bodies of the children. It was clear to see that this wasn't a plain old burglary. There was, some, there was more to this. This was a crime driven by hatred. Also on the 24th of May, Dunham started inquiries and straight, straight away he got a bit of look. A witness came forward. His suspicions about a fellow boarder aroused when he heard of the murders. A man called Charles Coombs came forward with information about a man he knew as John Jones, who was a man he boarded with in Bell Yard, Uxbridge. Jones had only recently been released from prison, on this occasion for stealing stockings off a washing line. He arrived back at Bell Yard on the Saturday with no money, no belongings and old and worn out clothes. He told Coombs he was going to get some money from his brother. The next day on the Sunday, Jones was dressed as a gentleman in a suit, carrying a carpet bag and wearing a watch and chain. A man who had nothing earlier was now buying drinks for everyone and eating steak dinners. On the Monday, Jones asked Coombs to go with him to the local pawnbrokers with a watch and chain. By Monday, by Monday evening, Jones was in the Queen's Head pub, still flush with cash, when a man came in and informed everyone about the murders. Now, straight away, Jones' demeanour changed and the penny dropped at last for Coombs. He informed the police. Superintendent Dunham showed him the blood-soaked clothes left at the cottage and he confirmed these were indeed the clothes Jones was wearing on the Saturday before the murders. Now by this time Jones had decided to get out of town but he had told Coombs and others that he was heading to Reading. Superintendent Dunham was a man of action. He wasn't a man to hide in an office. He grabbed Coombs to use for identification purposes and set off in hot pursuit. Reading was and is a big town, so it was going to be looking like a needle for a haystack, but they got a massive slice of luck. Arriving in Reading, Dunham, Dunham and Coombs made for the police station. They met Superintendent Purchase, who gave them one man. This man was already in Purchase's office, and he was PC William Hounsell Toolman, 
Not only did he know Reading like the back of his hand, but when described to him, he also said he had seen Jones and where he was heading. He had seen Jones crossing over High Bridge towards Silver Street and he guessed he was heading for the Oxford Arms. The three men went in pursuit. They entered the Oxford Arms. Coombs pointed out Jones and he was arrested without incident. Now legend says that he pulled out a pistol and Dunham overpowered him, but this is just myth. He was still wearing Emmanuel's trousers and boots and had a pawn ticket for his waistcoat coat and watch. He had a pistol which was one of a pair belonging to Emmanuel in his pocket and then he made the comment I have not murdered man, woman or child. Now this was before he was even informed of the charges and also before anyone in Reading knew of the murders because the newspapers have still not printed it yet. He was escorted to Reading Police Station where they had to arrange his delivery back to Slough. Now this was going to be very tricky as news travels fast and by the time they wanted to leave for the railway station a lynching crowd of around a thousand had gathered outside the police station. Anyway, the police managed to get round that obstacle, but it was reported that there were several thousand people waiting at Slough Railway Station. Somehow, the police, through a few uh, tactics of going through waiting rooms, etc., they managed to deliver the prisoners safely. But after the committal hearing, it was decided to hold the trial at Aylesbury Crown Court and Jones to be held in custody at Aylesbury Jail. The trial started on the 22nd of July. The evidence was overwhelming. Firstly, Jones told Daniel Love, a warder at Reading Jail, he was going to Oxbridge because a man there owed him money and he would have it or murder him. Then PC Taverna told how he had seen Jones near the Marshall Cottage at 3am on the morning of the murder. He thought he may be poaching but had no evidence to detain him. Then there were his clothes left at the scene. The clothes he was wearing, the pawn ticket, the items he stole and finally the key to the marshal's front door which had been thrown into a cupboard in his room at the lodging house. Probably because of this, his defence counsel put up a pretty pathetic fight, calling no witnesses, hopelessly questioning the prosecution witnesses and Jones himself getting no chance to speak up for himself. Now, a couple of things I'd like to put in here. Even though he went by the alias Jones, his real name was in fact John Owen. And secondly, the reason for the murder, it is thought, is that at some time earlier, Jones had worked for Emmanuel in the blacksmiths but ruined a wheel so badly that Emmanuel had to pay the customer to replace the wheel. He then fired Jones and refused to pay him. This led to Jones' resentment, which probably festered in his last time in jail. In any case, the jury took only two minutes to find Jones, Jones slash Owen guilty and he was sentenced to death by hanging. In the days leading up to the execution, he took it all in his stride, sometimes humming tunes or making jokes. He even asked if he could spend his last two nights in his own coffin. He did get annoyed at one point though, threatening to punch the hangman 
William Calcraft in the mouth for not going to see him as soon as he arrived. Anyway, at three minutes to eight on the morning of the 8th of August, he was brought by two warders to Calcraft, who had a bit of trouble with the buckles on the pinion. Jones, the condemned man, said, you will see better if I turn a bit to the light. And he did so. It is said he fell very heavy and he died instantly. He hung for the allotted hour before being lowered and laid out. And guess who was the first person on the scene? Yep, if you've been to this podcast before, you will know it was our little friend from Madame to Swords. Well, I hope you enjoyed that story. I have to give a massive thank you to the book The Denham Massacre by Neil Watson, published by Mango Books. This is the definitive story of the murders. It took Mr Watson three years to research and was absolutely invaluable in my writing of this. I actually bought the book. Uh, I'd already done a load of uh, research but found this book and it was amazing. So please look it up. Uh, I'd like to put a shout out for a great podcast I've recently started listening to, which is Weird Diver, W-E-I-R-D-I-V-A, which is hosted by Sari and Val. These two ladies bring really weird and diverse subjects to life with a great connection between the pair of them. Their humour and laughter is infectious and they really seem to be having fun, which, let's be honest, that's what it's all about. This week's episode did make me wince a bit. That's all I'm going to say, so please check them out for yourself. They are on Instagram with a link tree in their bio and be can, found, can be found on Apple, Spotify or all your favourite uh, podcast platforms. As always, I'd like to put a thank you out to Jonathan Seagev for the use of his cursed lullaby as my intro. And just a special mention to my friend Lindsay, who has just launched a great podcast, Stolen From Me, on YouTube. I think she's actually given up on the, all the other podcasts and is now only on YouTube. So please go and give her a watch. She's also on Instagram, Stolen From Me Pod. Now, I hope you enjoyed my little story tonight. I'd be really chuffed if you would rate it. If you really liked it, please leave a review, send me a message, and uh, do whatever you like. So see you in two weeks. And don't forget, not everyone is as mad as a box of frogs. So stay safe and please sleep well. <laughs>